This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by the Bitfinity Conference taking place in Miami Beach from October 30th to November 2nd. Join industry thought leaders, investors, and leading blockchain companies to discuss and showcase how they will use blockchains in a wide range of industries. Go to bitfinity.com slash epicenter for discounts on registrations and exhibitor packages. And by Jax. Jax is a user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we are joined by Ryan X. Charles, who is the co-founder and CEO of Yours. Yours is innovating in the content monetization space with, with Bitcoin. So we'll be talking about the challenges of content creators and how yours can make a difference to their life. So before we begin, let's have a brief background from, from Ryan. Ryan, something about your background and how you got involved in Bitcoin. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having me, guys. I'm really happy uh, that, that uh, you would have me on uh, your show. Um, so, yeah, my background is um, so I was uh, uh, a physicist for a total of about eight years. Uh, I was getting a PhD in physics at WashU in St. Louis. I discovered Bitcoin in 2011. And for some reason, I, I was just absolutely blown away with the technology of Bitcoin. I thought, uh, you know, this is this is unlike anything I've seen before. I was a little bit clued into the financial system and uh, I wasn't like an expert on economics at that time. Still not an expert. I've studied a bit since then. But um, I thought, well, this is really interesting. Like this is just totally unlike anything else. Like decentralized money. I didn't know that was possible. So in early 2011, I spent about three weeks just studying Bitcoin, um, trying to, you know, assess whether this was for real. Like, is this actually possible or is this some type of scam? Um, I think it's for real. Um, and uh, uh, so after after I had like this sort of, I don't know, this this sort of moment where it was just like, I was just sort of obsessed with it for about three weeks. Um, I then sort of went back and, and kept being a physicist for a while. Uh, but I, I, Bitcoin was on my radar and I, it was sort of a hobby, I guess you could say. I was sort of a Bitcoin advocate at that time. Uh, then 2013 came. And Bitcoin became sort of sufficiently real, sufficiently big. There were a bunch of VCs that started investing in it all of a sudden um, that I decided that, you know, this is this is for real. I'm going to regret it if I don't get into Bitcoin. So I decided to leave my PhD in physics and I, I uh, dove into the world of Bitcoin without knowing exactly what I was going to do. Um, but uh, I was an engineer because as a physicist, I wrote lots of software. I'm an experimental physicist. So I'm like, well, I don't know much about business, but I know how to write software, so maybe I can get a job as an engineer. And uh, so I uh, interviewed with BitPay, uh, the, the largest uh, Bitcoin payment processor. I ended up uh, joining BitPay and I worked there for a year. I wrote a lot of uh, open source software. I was, I, I suppose it's fair to say that while I worked at BitPay, I was the lead engineer on Bitcore. Um, I also played a really big role in, in, uh, in creating uh, Copay, uh, the, uh, BitPay's uh, uh, originally multi-sig wallet, now it's sort of the general wallet. BitPay was, uh, so it was a really, really great experience for me, really uh, informative. I met lots of wonderful people. I then had this very unusual opportunity to join uh, Reddit. And I'll let you guys ask questions if you're curious. I'm going to give the light version just because it would, it would take a long time to, uh, you know, give you the full version. So light version first. I talked with, uh, basically a, a recruiter reached out to me. Um, can't remember his name now. But the recruiter reached out to me, put me in touch with Yishan. Uh, Yishan was the CEO of Reddit uh, at that time and uh, had a really good conversation with Yishan. And uh, actually, I was like, OK, well, if I'm going to meet the CEO of Reddit, I just sat back and thought about this strategically. Like, well, this is kind of an unusual opportunity to meet the CEO of Reddit. What am I going to tell him? You know, I should say something to him and, and not and, you know, not waste this opportunity. I thought the most important thing I could say to you, Sean, was you guys have got to decentralize Reddit. That's your number one. You know, that if I were to join Reddit, I would work on that because that's a really cool. Like that would be that's the future is decentralization. So I that's what I said to you, Sean. And so we had a really cool talk. I mean, they had already thought about doing stuff like this. So I had a really good conversation with you, Sean. Um, I then, you know, basically kept interviewing. I interviewed with some engineers. I talked with you, Sean, again. And decided to leave BitPay and join Reddit and, and figure out you know uh, uh, you know how to how to do something like this at Reddit the company. So as far as I'm aware, I'm I'm the only person whose official title was cryptocurrency engineer like ever. I'm not aware of somebody else who ha had that title. 
Uh, and I'm also, as far as I'm aware, the only person who worked on sort of cryptocurrency projects in a, in a sort of full-time capacity at a mainstream social media company. So um, now what happened after I joined Reddit, and here's where I'm going to give you guys the light version and feel free to dive into the details if, if you want. Basically, uh, there was unrelated uh, drama going on at Reddit at the time, and Yishan decided to resign after I was there for a month and a half. And when Yishan resigned, I kept working on, on the project, um, but it, it sort of, the, the, the board and the new executives had their hands full with all sorts of other stuff. So it basically just killed the project that I was doing. Uh, and so I had to leave uh, after a little while. And uh, then I decided to join uh, a company called BitGo. Uh, and I joined BitGo because it just sort of fit well with, with everything I was doing on, from a Bitcoin and software point of view. It's a Bitcoin security company since I had worked on Copay at, at BitPay. I knew a lot about multisig and, and uh, you know, JavaScript engineering and stuff since I'm an engineer. So I worked there uh, for a while. And then last year in the summer of 2015, I wrote an article called Fix Reddit with Bitcoin. Because after I left Reddit, Reddit kept going through this sort of uh, period of turbulence. And uh, uh, this article I wrote was really popular. It really caught on with the Bitcoin community. It really caught on with some, some uh, technology people outside of Bitcoin. So uh, I realized I had a, this sort of a seed of an idea that I wanted to explore. So I decided to leave BitGo and pursue this full time. And that project would evolve into what is now called Yours, um, which is a, you could call it a, it's just a social media uh, uh, app where we have integrated Bitcoin micropayments. And we're trying to solve this problem of getting content creators paid. Because there are all these people out there that write content, not just write, but produce videos, music, audio, whatever, on Facebook, on Reddit, on Twitter, on Medium, on SoundCloud, on YouTube, and they don't get paid anything. Or if they get paid something, it's not very much. And usually they don't get paid anything, I mean, especially on like Facebook. Um, so we're trying to solve that problem. Uh, and that's what I'm full-time on now. So that, that's, the, that's the, my history in a nutshell. That's a fascinating history. And I, I guess we could sort of see the progression from, you know, going from uh, working as a, an engineer at uh, at BitPay, working on Bitcore to then, you know, being at Reddit and, and then building uh, multi-sig software at, uh, at Bitco to you know, sort of the logical progression now to, you know, building a social network that uh, pays content creators and curators for the value that they bring into the system. Before we get into the questions on, on yours, uh, since you did work at Reddit and you were full time on this idea of uh, be building, you know, the decentralized Reddit, you know, they've sort of moved away from that idea. What are your thoughts on Steam uh, and what they're trying to build? Yeah, so Steam is definitely Steam executed on this idea of what if you could build like a community on the basis of a new currency or a new blockchain and you sort of decide the economics of that community. So Steam invented new economics with their own new blockchain, their own new currency, with this integrated platform where people can, can create content, right? Uh, so it's, it's a really, really cool experiment, I think. I'm really like, excited to see Steam. There are a lot of, uh, we have this list of related projects that's pretty long. There are a bunch of people that have had ideas that are really similar uh, to, to something involving like cryptocurrency and monetizing content and stuff. And Steam took this the really, uh, I think almost most sort of a extreme idea of like inventing their own you know blockchain. So we sort of deliberately didn't go that route, but I'll, I'll avoid uh, you know uh, diving into that uh, yet. I think it's a really cool experiment. I'm glad to see that uh, you know they've gotten a bunch of attention. We've actually gotten a bunch of attention via Steam just because people are like, wow, maybe there's something to this idea of cryptocurrency and you know social media. So we've actually gotten more attention for our project. Just because we're like the, the the next closest thing to doing you know doing something like this, we haven't launched yet. Uh, but you know there there are all the other projects are uh, a little bit uh, maybe further behind. I would say we'll we'll see if if anybody else sort of rolls something out soon. Um, but uh, yeah, so Steam's really interesting. You know what we're building isn't isn't quite the same. We get compared uh, to them a lot because of the way that I've described the project uh, in the past and. You know, I, I, since I worked at Reddit and everything, and originally I announced our project was a decentralized Reddit, which is actually really kind of what Steam is. They really actually did that. We're, what we're doing isn't quite a, a decentralized Reddit, but, but in any case, yeah, I think it's a really uh, interesting project and it's, it's cool to see how that'll play out. Cool, so let's get into what yours is. So describe yours in 
your own words. Sure. So first of all, I, I think, uh, you know, anybody who's clued into the space of social media, you're, you're probably aware of things like, uh, at least from a business point of view, you know, Facebook and Google earn a huge amount of money from advertising. Um, they've now like, you know, they, they're absolutely these sort of enormous sort of giants compared to traditional media. Uh, Google and Facebook, these, these fairly new companies as far as, you know, history goes, has, have done a better job leveraging the Internet than New York Times or, you know, television companies, NBC or whatever. Um, but what's happening is there are all these people that create content. Uh, for these platforms, uh, Facebook being the the biggest one, probably uh, YouTube's definitely way up there. Um, you know, Reddit is a big one as well. Reddit is yeah, somewhere in the neighborhood of like 150 million active users. Uh, I, I don't know the latest numbers, um, but a lot of people create content for these platforms, but they're actually being paid zero. So the companies earn money, and sometimes the companies are profitable. In the case of Facebook and Google, in the case of Reddit, uh, the last I'm aware of, I don't think they're profitable yet. I think they're they're still uh, you know spending more money than they're taking in. So there's there's there are a couple things maybe wrong with the advertising uh, sort of business model. Uh, one is that the content creators usually get paid zero, so that seems a little bit unfair. I mean, like, wouldn't that be cool if there were a way for these people that are creating content for for these social media platforms could actually earn money for their for all the value that they're creating? And the other one is that maybe advertising isn't necessarily the best business model uh, for every type of content. I mean, maybe it's a business model that works sometimes, but maybe there are other things where maybe maybe there are better business models. So anyway, we see this, this opportunity here where all these people, and I could give lots of examples of this, but there are just communities of people that create content for free. And I think the real reason why they do this is it wasn't really technically possible to monetize uh, what they were doing until fairly recently. I think Bitcoin creates the, uh, the, the foundation and then some type of layer on top of Bitcoin, like the, the Lightning Network, uh, really enables us to finally have actual peer-to-peer -peer micropayments so that you can monetize uh, internet content uh, in a way that's not based on advertising. So that's what we're trying to do. We're creating a, a social media destination with uh, an integrated Bitcoin wallet. The users post content. And what we're trying to do is uh, find the right uh, model or maybe a market of models where we just uh, empower uh, the users to earn money from this. And then while also solving this complementary problem of giving people a reason to pay for content. So anyway, all that sounds pretty uh, generic, uh, uh, but uh, I could describe the product maybe in, in detail. But that's the big picture. There are all these people creating content on the Internet, not being paid anything whatsoever. And we think if we can get those people paid, that this is going to be a big deal. That sounds like a like a like a really big problem to attack, right? Like, because uh, uh, being YouTube content creators, we are we kind of see this problem daily. And uh, I've kind of uh, so so for this for this podcast, maybe we could take a couple of different examples. So um, when we say content creators, like just to personify content creator in the minds of our audience we could have a few different examples so example number one could be some some person who has a youtube channel which where he or she says something and is very popular goes into the millions of views so i dug through uh, one of the top people making money on youtube is jenna marbles who uh, who the hell is Jenna Marbles? Hmm? <laughs> who the yeah. hell is Jenna Marbles? I, I, I know who she is, actually. Yeah, so. Yeah. <laughs> so she Jenna Marbles apparently makes uh, around $2 million a year uh, on YouTube. Wow. Because uh, she has uh, a total of 3.5 billion views on all of her videos to date. Okay. And so that's that's one kind of content creator. Like This kind of content creator is massive, right? Like is a lot of, a lot of views, probably very low production costs, and YouTube already kind of um, has a way of monetizing her content and delivering her part of the things. But uh, the issue also here is in, in this in cases like this, YouTube takes a 45% cut. So whatever YouTube makes out of advertising from her videos, 45% goes to YouTube, 55% goes to her. That's one kind of content creator. Another kind of content creator is um, somebody like us epicenter bitcoin or let's say a talk show that talks about the latest game of thrones episode so they make reviews of 
new new equipment new technologies or new shows and and these people generally don't have the number of views in order to really make a living like jenna marbles right so that's another kind of content creator maybe a third kind of content creator is somebody who either blogs or puts up really great posts about things on reddit let's say there might be a guy who really makes really great posts about virtual reality and he reviews all of the products that are there and he posts them on reddit and probably gets paid nothing for it so so we'll have like these three examples yeah uh, like jenna marbles huge the these the let's say the game of thrones reviewing channel who doesn't get paid much and the third uh third person is somebody who blogs and posts on reddit and who doesn't get paid anything at all and let's walk through how yours can impact all of them right would that be a good experiment yeah no, that's a great experiment so that's a great way to frame it this is one way to look at it like you know the sort of different you know different scales different levels of you know uh, uh whether you're full-time or not stuff like that you know so jenna marbles is I, i've seen some of her videos so she's She's almost like I, I hope I'm not being you know, I hope I'm not mischaracterizing her, but she's a very normal person who makes these very normal videos, uh, and so I think she she just latches on to people. She's like one of these people that um, she's uh, very very good at capturing sort of a, an audience of other normal people. So the audience is just absolutely enormous. Apparently, I didn't know how much money she's earning. That seems like a huge figure to me. So she's like a power user. She's a power content creator. And YouTube is an interesting platform just because like it's one of the few platforms that actually provides a way for people to monetize. So if you're really successful on YouTube, you can be very successful like Jenna Marbles is. But Jenna Marbles is uh, sort of an exception. Uh, most users are not anywhere near uh, Jenna Marbles scale. There, there's a, there's a, 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 you know, a long tail here where there's some small number of creators that are earning a lot and then a long tail of people that aren't earning very much of, of anything. So sort of on the opposite side of the spectrum would be the small time content creators. And let's just think, I mean, let's assume we're focusing on people that are actually putting some care into what they're doing and actually doing a good job. Cause there are definitely content creators that are, you know, if you just post some random comment, it isn't necessarily good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so some of them are, some of them aren't, but let's focus on people that are actually trying to create something good that like, and it would actually be nice if they could you know, monetize this somehow. Um, so, you know, most of those people aren't being paid anything. So I don't know where you guys, you're, you're somewhere in the middle on the spectrum. You're not as famous or popular as- No, we're way down, way, way down on the spectrum. <laughs> we're close, we're pretty close to that guy making videos about, uh, you know, virtual reality or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so you guys have an audience though. So you're, you know, you, you do have an audience. You, you're, you're, you're probably earning something, uh, but probably not millions of dollars per year like, like Jenna Marbles is. Um, and uh, then there are the people that aren't earning anything and have, have a very small audience. Um, also, there are different types of content to consider. Uh, so, you know, like you're saying, Mayor, uh, you know, uh, articles, you know, people that write articles. I write articles for free on Medium. Um, we're definitely not targeting the superstars on day one because I think we have very little to offer them. You know, if, if Jenna Marbles wanted to use your platform, I mean, she has a lot more to give. Like if she used our platform, that would be amazing because it would draw attention to us, but I don't think she's gonna earn very much money on yours on day one. Like she's already earning enough from you, from uh, YouTube that you know if she earns $10 from yours, it doesn't really make any difference to her. But if someone who isn't earning anything earns $10 on yours, that makes a huge difference to them. Especially uh, there are a lot of people in the world where $10 actually makes a meaningful difference in their life. So those are the people we're targeting. We're, we're targeting, targeting the long tail, all these other people that aren't being serviced whatsoever by YouTube or these other monetization uh, platforms. And then also just consider the fact that, you know, there are people that are really, you know, professional content creators creating on, content on platforms that aren't social media, you know, on the New York Times or whatever, you might be a writer for the New York Times. We're not targeting those people either because they already have a job. They don't really have the problem we're talking about. We're talking about people that are either not earning anything or not earning enough. You know, there are people where it would make a huge difference to them to earn even just a little bit of money. Those are the people that, that we're, that we're uh, uh, trying to create a, a platform for. Let's take a short break to talk about Bitfinity, the Miami blockchain conference to be held this year from October 30th until November 2nd. Blockchain technology has been exiting the world of nerds and hackers and entering the mainstream. We're at the beginning of a big revolution that's going to fundamentally change how the world works. At the Bitfinity conference, we're going to have the heavyweight speakers 
such as Don Tapscott, who wrote the book The Blockchain Revolution, or Joe Lubin of the Startup Consensus. But we're also going to have the industry panels that focus on real-world use cases and bring together both the tech expert who really understand blockchain and the kind of key decision makers that will help blockchain become a real commercial success. Now, you may just want to pack your bags and buy a ticket to Miami, and that's certainly a good idea. But if you're involved in a project or startup, there's something even better. Bitfinity will feature dozens of presentations by starting startups, so you can apply for the presenter package, get an exhibitor stand, and speak on the main stage to an audience of 500 to 1,000 high-level people, including many VCs and top decision makers. And of course, all that while sipping a martini in a luxury hotel in Miami Beach where Frank Sinatra once sang on stage. To learn more how you can join startups like Factum, Consensus, Everledger, and Stellar. Visit them at bitfinity.com slash epicenter and find out how you can get 10% off the company presenter package or your $200 discount code to attend. We'd like to thank Bitfinity for their support of Epicenter. Slightly unclear to me at this point, is, is yours a uh, simply a technological platform on which social networks could be built or is it actually a social network? Uh, is it the equivalent of, I don't want to, vol you know, uh, it's kind of uh, a vulgar description of what I mean, but like, is it a CMS or is it the social network on which you build the? Uh, great, great question. So we are, we are trying to build the actual social network, not just a platform for other social networks, but an actual destination. So you'll go to yours.network and log in the same way you would with Reddit or some other social media site. We won't have a mobile app on day one, but I think it's really important that we get on mobile. So maybe the way most people get it is by just going to the app store and downloading yours. So it'll be an actual app that faces uh, end users. But you're asking a good question because um, I think one, once you start considering the possibilities of what if you just had micropayments integrated into content, there's a giant space of possible products. And here's where I, I start being, being really generic and vague when I talk about this. I, we can narrow it down, but uh, it's because it's really like there really are a lot of possibilities. And so we're trying to first build the simplest product that we think will work. But we do think that there's actually a big space of possibilities here. And our role model here is Reddit. Uh, Reddit has created a community that is actually a bunch of sub communities. Um, if you're a big Reddit power user, you're probably on a small handful of subreddits and you don't care about any of the other subreddits. You care about the subreddits that are important to you. For instance, r slash fitness is a big one. If you're, you're a fitness buff, uh, you might like r slash fitness. Uh, there, are, there are a whole bunch of these that are just, there's r slash Bitcoin, of course, for Bitcoin users, which is, you know, basically everyone in the Bitcoin community is, is on r slash Bitcoin. And there are all these communities for other, uh, you know, various interests. So I think that there's power for us to create a platform of platforms. So we are a destination. But at the same time, we empower the users to tweak the rules of the economics so that they can create something that's appropriate for their community. So I would describe us as, as a destination. It's not just a protocol, but we, we, we are also like sort of, I guess you could say it's market minded. Like we like the idea of empowering the users to, to define what the product means uh, for their community. Okay. Hey, so when when I think about this, and we were discussing this earlier on the show, before the show with Mayor, is when when you look at the history of social networks that have become successful, because there's been you know for every successful social network there have been maybe like a hundred that have failed. Um, all of the successful social networks, whether it be Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, uh, some of the other ones like Periscope or whatever, all have a unique. Um, a, a unique position and value proposition in terms of functionality. So, you know, they, every, every one of those networks has brought on a new functionality uh, that is very specific and, and very targeted. So take Instagram, for instance, like posting photos with, um, with filters and it has stayed true to that. And that's what has made it so powerful and so successful. Um, the monetization often, and for many still doesn't exist, but is often an, off, an afterthought. I guess my question is, what is the the unique feature aside from monetization, uh, which I, I don't particularly think would lure people in on it itself? What type of features uh, would yours uh, propose to its users in order to uh, you know reach this objective, this 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 goal of uh, of being massively used by you know thousands and hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people? 
Yeah. So, well, first of all, I, I actually think monetization may be it. I mean, I think, I think monetization by, by, by itself can go a really long way. I think that'll be the strongest reason for people to use this app. If we actually succeed in, in getting our users paid real money, uh, we actually empower them to really earn money. Um, I think that will be uh, a reason for them to use our platform, uh, at least in addition to, if not as a replacement for, for other platforms. Um, uh, uh, with respect to like, again, I'm gonna be really vague here. I, let me try and give you some concrete examples, okay? Let me, let me give you a concrete product idea um, that has never you know, been done, or rather I should say the, the way we would do it would be different than anything that's been done before. It's an idea we've, we've run through recently. Now, I'm not promising we're going to launch this idea, but this will give you an idea of what I mean. So uh, there's, a, there's a website called Shutterstock where you can buy stock imagery, uh, where, you know, imagine you're making a website. You just need like a background photo of some people with a laptop or something. You can go there and get stuff like that. You can, you can buy, you know, content. I think, I think there's a monthly fee or something like that is how they, is how they monetize it. Mm -hmm. So you have to go there and pay a monthly fee to get stock imagery. Well, what if on yours... You know, you could create a community for stock imagery. And the idea is, you know, you can see all the images at low resolution for free. But in order to see the image at high resolution, which is what you're going to want uh, to print it out or to put it on your website or something, you have to pay one cent. So you have to click a button, um, you know, to, to make a payment. But it's that easy, right? It's, it's not like, you know, you don't have to sign up for a recurring payment, which you don't necessarily need. You just want this one payment. It's worth one cent to you, which is really small. Could be bigger than that but it could also be that small. Um, well, that would draw people in. That would draw in that community of people. That would draw in people that want to produce stock imagery and have a platform where they can share it. And also the people that want to buy just one image. You just want to buy one stock image. I don't need a monthly subscription to a, to a, a website. I just need this one image. So that would be an example of a little community. I think that could work. And again, I'm not promising we're going to do that specific one. Um, but there are a lot of ideas like this. If you just run through the space of possibilities of what if I could pay for things on the internet, um, it's really there are a bunch of product ideas involving who pays for what and when and how much they pay for and why are they paying? Are they paying to buy it? Are they paying to invest in it? And you'd be, you, you, just, you just have to have the technology there first and foremost. You've got to actually make these micropayments possible first. Then building these little products are relatively easy. So we can, we can build, we can experiment with adding these features, telling our users, look, we've added this cool new feature. What you can now do is you can display a photo for free and then the users have to pay one cent to view, view the full uh, you know, resolution version of this image and let the users uh, design their community uh, you know, to use that feature. So I think the, the, way, the, the way I now see it playing out would be, we will empower the users to create these uh, communities with, with unique features. Uh, and it'll, the, the community that becomes the most popular one first will probably be not, hopefully not be something that we can conceive of. Because the whole idea is that they'll be better at figuring this out than, than we will. So I don't know what product will take off first or what community will take off first. But it'll be something unique with uh, where uh, uh, you know, uh, content creators are being paid and it's servicing some type of niche audience that most people don't care about, but that niche audience really cares about. And to them, it solves that problem that they have. Um, and then once people start you know, uh, coming to our platform, you, know, you can create other communities that, that uh, service other uh, uh, niches and other, other communities with other you know, product ideas and stuff. So ho hopefully that answers your question. In a nutshell, I would, I would uh, my basic answer is I, I would argue that the monetization part actually is a really, really good selling point that if we can nail that correctly, uh, that actually will draw people to our platform more than more than anything else. So personally, I believe the, the monetization is 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 sufficient to to draw users and um, to give you a feel for um, some examples I see in my in my daily life. Uh, like <clears throat> I love the show Game of Thrones. And there are these small channels that are, they, 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 they take episodes from the series and they make, you know, commentary on the episodes. And I love seeing them because uh, these people that create these videos think in ways I don't. So I, I find that really valuable. And these people get like 50 or 60,000 views a day. And I walk through their financials and uh, what, I, what I kind of re realized is 
these guys can only do this for a hobby with 50,000 or 60,000 uh, views per episode and like four episodes a month. But many of these people actually want to do this full time and they want to branch out to new shows and do it more, but they really can't because there's no way of uh, monetizing what it is they do. Right. So I'm, I'm guessing that if there was a really good monetization mechanism for them, they would go full time. They would be able to invest in equipment and then they would, they would, they would get users. Yeah. So uh, I personally, I'm, I completely buy into the premise that there is a big long tail of people that are creative. And if you could give them the right uh, monetization model, they would go come out in full force. And maybe over, over a decade, it develops a new kind of media in industry altogether, just like YouTube has created a new media industry. Given that, like, uh, I think the the uh, the interesting questions to me are, uh, how does your start a like what kind of communities does it start with, and then come come the technical questions, which is uh, like if you wanted to build a platform of platforms, then basically you need something like a financial logic, and then something that stores content, and then you there's something that kind of gives a user interface, and how do all of these things connect, right? So there are two components here. We, maybe we address the technical one later. I'll let you guys maybe ask that again. Uh, but then there is the uh, you asked a good question though, which is again I, I sort of I'm sort of vague about this now, but who are our core users? Okay, like what is community number one here? And the reason why I'm vague is because we actually haven't identified this yet. So I think it's really important. So we have you know you guys have, have heard of our project. Uh, many people in the Bitcoin space have heard of our project. Okay. We have at this rate, uh, something like 3,000 people on our mailing list. I'm quite sure almost all of those people are Bitcoin users. I haven't pulled them, but I bet most of them are. Um, and uh, so we, we've got attention in the Bitcoin community. We, we could make a platform that was for Bitcoin users first. I mean, this would be like a really straightforward, like what if we just made, you know, Reddit, but with Bitcoin, I bet Bitcoin users would use it. Um, however, I don't think it's in anybody's interest that we do this first. Bitcoin users would probably most benefit from it if we created something mainstream. They would actually probably rather we service a mainstream audience because everybody in the Bitcoin space wins if we start servicing people outside the Bitcoin community. Also, from our business point of view, you know, I'm a, I'm a Bitcoin user. I've been in the Bitcoin space since 2011. Um, if, I, if we create a platform that services Bitcoin users, well, OK, I mean, I'd be happy with it and my friends would be happy with it. But we would have no idea whether we are solving a real world problem or whether we're just solving something for Bitcoin users. So I think it's really important that we identify one community to be our core audience that are not already Bitcoin users. Because if we can get some group of people that actually like are, you know, getting value from this product and actually use it, actually really love what we're building for them, then we can know we've solved that problem of like making a mainstream product that we're not just making something that's so technically sophisticated that you can only understand if you're a Bitcoin user. We'll, we'll know that if we've got normal, uh, normal okay, just <laughs> non-Bitcoin people, they probably won't be normal actually. Whatever it is, it'll probably be some niche audience that, that it isn't normal, but it'll, still, it'll be something that's outside of Bitcoin where we can know that you know, we're, we're solving something for uh, people that aren't already really clued into Bitcoin. Um, so let me give you an example. Uh, recently, I've been I've been learning about uh, manga in Japan. If you guys know about this, I'm not a big like manga fan, but there are a lot of reasons why we think that audience might be good for us. That they're really uh, sort of young, sophisticated people that create manga, which are Japanese comics, and there's there are huge communities of these people, and they they have the same problem as these these other people. They you know they're creating content, they're not really able to monetize this anyway. But if they had a way to monetize it, they would love to do this full time. Like they would quit their job in a heartbeat and start making internet content. If they could only earn money doing this. Um, so that's an example of an audience. We, we could maybe start with manga. Um, and the way this would work would be, you know, we basically talk with our manga users, um, tell them, you know, what our value proposition is that you can start earning money by creating and discovering good manga. Um, and make, make the product suitable for them first so that you can easily post, you know, graphic imagery. You know, if they're creating in the form of like a you know, PNG or whatever, or either it's a PDF or how it is, make it really easy for them to post that. Make it easy for them to, maybe you have to, maybe you can see the black and white version for free and you have to pay to see the color version, for instance. We'll just talk with them and figure it out. Most of the actual software engineering effort has to go into these micropayments. And these little product tweaks that we have to make to service the manga community 
are fairly easy at a technical level. Um, so all we have to do is talk with them and make sure we're, we're uh, you know, sort of actually, uh, you know, making it, uh, you know, tuned for their use. And I think, I think, uh, you know, a group. I don't want to say that Manga necessarily would be the first user, but, but something like that. It's a niche community. Um, it's outside of Bitcoin. Not everyone likes Manga, but the people that do like it really like it. It's, it's a really important part of their lives. And there are these content creators that, gosh, if only they could earn some money from this, they totally would do it. Um, so that's that's how it'll really be. And so we don't actually know that core community yet. That's something we have to figure out in the next six months or so, because we're still in a very technical phase. We're going to launch this in phases. Um, we're, we will target, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically just people close to us first. But within the next six months, we'll have to figure out who this core audience is and uh, and uh, actually make sure that, that what we're building uh, works for those people. So. I like this idea of of, uh, of going after an audience uh, and, and really figuring out what their needs are before you know, building building a, sort of a huge product. That uh, so I'm I'm very product focused myself, so this is sort of a uh, a construct that I identify with. Um, one of the challenges I'm sure you've thought of is uh, you know and has been probably the challenge of a lot of startups uh, in the in the in the Bitcoin community specifically. Uh, with anything that has to do with payments is getting people on board into Bitcoin, right? So getting people to have Bitcoin in their in their in their pocket or in their cell phone uh, to be able to engage in these types of systems. So, how do you foresee uh, engaging? Say you take the the absolutely the the, the anime community uh, or manga community. Uh, how do you foresee uh, uh, them acquiring Bitcoin? In order to participate in this uh, in this system, yeah, totally. So the, the the onboarding this is a this is something that sort of plagued the Bitcoin community the whole time, right? Like we're we're you know we're like we think this technology is so wonderful to solve so many problems, but there's there really is still like there's there's this onboarding problem where it's it's still kind of difficult to get it. It's wallets are wallets have improved a lot over the years, but they're still kind of technically sophisticated. Um, you know, if if a normal user has to back up their private key. You've just lost like a huge fraction of the world population who's who doesn't understand what you're talking about as soon as you say you need a backup, you know, your private key or whatever. So there is an onboarding problem. Um, uh, I'll just I'll sort of explain how how I think to solve this. Um, I, I think we just need to make it really really easy to get in and out with fiat currency. So you know other platforms that involve payments have uh, have have an onboarding problem. Okay. In order to get into PayPal, you've got to like put money into PayPal somehow. Um, the way PayPal actually solved this originally was they raised a hundred million dollars. They gave fifty million dollars, or I don't know if I'm remembering the numbers exactly, but they gave something like fifty million dollars to their early users and basically said, you know, if you just sign up, um, uh, we will just give you ten dollars or fifty dollars or something like that. That is not out of the question for us. You know, if we raised a bunch of money, we could do that. Like we could maybe raise money with the explicit purpose of giving it away. I don't think we necessarily have to do that, though. Uh, the users that create content do not have to have Bitcoin to be paid. So you can start using the app and earning money without necessarily uh, having any Bitcoin at all uh, on day one. But if you're going to meet, make payments to someone, like if you're investing in a piece of content, you're curating content or whatever it is, um, you do have to have Bitcoin. Well, uh, we just make it as easy as possible. Fortunately, uh, in the U.S. anyway, Coinbase now has this, uh, 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 you can integrate like a Coinbase sort of widget where you can easily buy Bitcoin with a credit card. We haven't tried using this yet, but that's the right idea. If we could just integrate, like you, it's just as easy as typing in your credit card, which isn't that easy. I think if you already had Bitcoin, it would be easier to send it from another wallet. But for those people who don't, typing in their credit card information is no harder than buying something on any website. Um, so if, if we can make it that easy, then at least getting the Bitcoin is is as easy as using payments, you know, anywhere else. Um, so I think that th that and then the other thing would be how do you use the Bitcoin? Uh, for that, we would we would just uh, integrate with other services. I like uh, services. I like uh, Purse.io. Wouldn't it be cool if you could uh, if we could just have like a buy buy this with Purse.io button on our app, so that when you've got money, you can just basically click a button right away and buy something with it. I think that would be really cool. So you just have to make it fluid for the users to get on and off. And then again, I'll emphasize that not everyone even has to have Bitcoin to use the app. If you're a content creator, you do not have to have Bitcoin to start being paid Bitcoin. So the onboarding problem for them is you just have to make something that's good quality content and, and uh, you can earn money for it. So. Today's magic word is social. 
S O C I A L. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. One like identifying feature about the yours project is it's uh, kind of you're kind of betting on Bitcoin all in, right? Like you're, you're not like steam it creating your own currency. And you have had like blog posts saying you're also not going to go in the Ethereum direction because uh, because you think Bitcoin is the biggest ecosystem. It's going to uh, has the biggest community and that matters a lot. Yeah. On the other side, on the, the flip side of this argument that I can think of is, uh, and I'm trying to be the devil's advocate here. Um, you, you have said previously on the show that uh, you don't know what community you're going to is going to be first what community you're going to focus on right and my perception is uh different kinds of c- c- content creators need different kinds of financial instruments so let's let's let, let's let's take a few examples for instance if you're kind of creating video and creating video needs some kind of instrumentation around it then you might need a financial instrument which is like okay i want to issue shares in the video and if this media video makes advertising revenue, then the shareholders that are invested in, in the shares of that video get paid. Right? Yeah. That This is like a proto DAO. It's a, it's a DAO really, right? But we, we can't call it a DAO because it's centralized across this content creator, but it's essentially the financial logic of a DAO. Yeah. Um, something like Reddit or Steemit um, has a different kind of financial logic in which there's the initial content creator and then there are sets of curators that are upvoting and downvoting things. And you want the initial content creator and the curators to be paid. So that's a different kind of financial logic. Right. Maybe there's a third kind of financial logic in which um, some content creator needs to buy specific equipment in order to do his stuff. And this guy needs loans. So can you crowdsource loans to this content creator? Yeah. Now, you come into this space where you realize different con- content creators have different financial needs. And what seems to me the case is because they have different financial needs, Ethereum might be a better platform for it because using the smart contract architecture, all of these financial needs could be met. Whereas Bitcoin's restriction of scripting language would not allow for many kinds of financial instruments to be expressed well. So why did you go for with Bitcoin rather than Ethereum? Yeah. So that, that's a really good question. I mean, I'll, I'll give you the reason here. So we've been, you know, I, I guess part of it is, the, the, the basic answer is very simple. You know, Bitcoin has the biggest economy. It is the most useful. It's the most liquid. You can easily get in and out of Bitcoin relatively easily compared to the other cryptocurrencies. A lot of the other cryptocurrencies, in order to get in and out of it, you got to go through Bitcoin. You know, you, you got to trade your steam for Bitcoin before you can get dollars. Um, that, I, I don't know if that's, that, that's not true for all of them, but it's true for some of them. Um, you can do things with Bitcoin. You can buy things. There are many more merchants that accept Bitcoin. Um, you know, uh, more people know what Bitcoin is. The audience is just bigger. Like if you, you know, the, as small as the audience for Bitcoin is relative to say Facebook or something, it's way, 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 way bigger than any of the other ones. Um, so it really just has the largest economy. So that's purely at like a sort of social economic level. It's just, it's very fluid. So it's true that uh, Bitcoin doesn't have the technical features that Ethereum has. But it's not like it's impossible to do those things with Bitcoin. It's just harder. Uh, and my sort of stance is, my prediction is that all the things you can do with Ethereum will eventually happen with Bitcoin just later, uh, just when, it, when, it, when you need it. Right now, we just need money. You know, all these financial instruments are really sort of valuable and they're valuable for the right, uh, you know, right people. So, you know, let's, let's run through this, how this would work on our platform. So wouldn't it be cool if there was a way for someone to like loan money to another person? That if you are buying audio equipment, so there are two ways you could imagine funding this. One would be debt, where you know someone just gives you the money, but then you have to pay it back with interest. Okay, uh, that would be cool if you could do that on this platform. Uh, that would that's totally a way to get uh, you know to to you know use this this funding mechanism or financial instrument uh, to you know uh, sort of solve this problem for someone. Another uh, thing would be equity, uh, where rather than give them like a loan, you are uh, actually investing in them. And now you own 10% of, you know, of ownership in that either that piece of content or their company or whatever it is. And you get paid out, you know, if there's a dividend payout, you get 10% of the dividend payout, something like that. So equity is another, another kind. Um, 
there are all sorts of other things you can do as well, like when and, and, and how, you know, when you pay for things, who gets what fraction of the money and stuff like that. So you can play with these variables and really come up with, you know, unique solutions to problems that some people would have. But we can do all that with, with Bitcoin. Uh, we Not everything necessarily has to be done on a decentralized blockchain. Some of these things are just normal contracts. Um, you know, if, if it's the case that you can just loan someone money, then you can just loan them money. It doesn't necessarily have to be something that's on a blockchain. If we decide it needs to be, then we would have to solve that problem for Bitcoin. I think we would. In some cases, you do want it to be on a blockchain. So we would have to solve that problem, which is non-trivial. Uh, there is, you know, Rootstock is trying to do exactly that. The side chains, people are trying to do stuff like that. Um, uh, there are other ways. Not everything requires necessarily a blockchain or a separate chain or something like that. You can do a lot of things with just normal smart contracts on Bitcoin. They are limited compared to Ethereum. It's not Turing complete, but our micropayments technology is all based on uh, Bitcoin smart contracts. So there are probably other things you can do with just Bitcoin scripts. So the, the simple answer is, you know, Bitcoin is just the biggest. And we're starting with payments first. We, we, I do think if we're successful, we're going to want to really play with all these other financial instruments. But that'll be a ways down the line when we have the resources to solve it on top of Bitcoin. So there's the benefit of Bitcoin is that it's a little bit easier to do it now, but it will be a little bit harder to do those more sophisticated things later. Um, so that's true. Um, I do think, you know, there is room for experiment here. I mean, like, you know, if imagine, you know, we, we would change our minds if, if Ethereum displaced Bitcoin. Now, I don't think that's going to happen. I think Bitcoin will probably stay the largest. I think there is huge value in being the goal of the Internet, which is effectively what Bitcoin is. It doesn't have to have all the features that the other ones have, because the fact that it's the largest and the most stable and there's a finite supply of it actually are the most important features. Um, and it's the most secure, you know, the most proof of work. All these features are actually really, really important and actually, I think, give it the most value. But, uh, you know, if, if, if this argument stopped working in the future because Ethereum became bigger, we would find a way either to switch or to accept Ethereum if that happened. I mean, it would be, you know, like if that actually were the case, you know, we want to do the, the thing that's the best for our users. So it could be that Ethereum would end up being better. I don't see it playing out that way. I mean, I think for now we basically had to pick. Um, we can't do both now. Uh, we're limited with resources. I think a the, a, a Bitcoin being the biggest is a really strong argument to do it. And then I'll just add one other thing, which is that by using Bitcoin, we're really able to offload a lot of really hard work onto other people. So we didn't invent the Lightning Network. We're, we're implementing it. We're writing software, but we didn't have to figure out how to do it because other people figured that out. Huge to us that other people were able to make that giant intellectual contribution uh, to create the Lightning Network. Same thing with all sorts of advances that are happening right now in Bitcoin Core. Segregated Witness was just like merged. Uh, it's not it's not live yet on mainnet, but it will be. That's a huge advance that's going to be really, really useful to everyone in the space that we didn't do. Other people in the space did it. And Bitcoin has the largest sort of, you know, it's the largest economy, not just of businesses and stuff, but all the developers and everybody in the space working to help solve these problems. So it's... I, I think I think this will be the right move, but it's it's you know it's hard to predict the future with accuracy. But in any case, the fact that it's the biggest is is uh, is the reason. Let's take a short break to talk about Jax. Jax is a multi-coin wallet created by the people at Decentral. Now, in the past, if you had a whole bunch of cryptocurrencies, it was a pain to handle them. You either had to leave them on an exchange, which was insecure, or you had to have all these different wallets, which was a hassle. Fortunately, now with Jax, those medieval days of darkness, misery, and suffering are over. Jax supports multiple cryptocurrencies and new ones are being added. But it's not just storing cryptocurrencies you can do with Jax, but you can also exchange them directly from within inside the wallet thanks to their Shapeshift integration. And since there's only one seed, Jax makes it super easy to back up and sync to your other devices. Jax works with Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, iOS, and has browser extensions for Firefox and Chrome. So go to jax.io, that's J A X .io, to download the wallet and get started today. We'd like to thank Jax for their support of Epicenter. So you mentioned the Lightning Network, so then let's, uh, I guess, let's get into the technical components of, uh, of yours. So can you tell us um, you know, broadly, what are the technical components of yours? How, what does the stack, the technology stack look like? And how does it leverage uh, Lightning Network in order to make uh, micropayments? 
so the, I'll just give you the, the tech stack. We're writing everything in JavaScript. It's Node.js. Um, the reason for this is this is the, the best way for us to reach consumers because at the end of the day, we're making a consumer app, and we don't want to write. We don't want to have to implement things twice. So using JavaScript means we write the code one time and it runs everywhere. So the stuff that needs to run on a server runs on a ser server. The stuff that needs to run, run in a web browser runs in a web browser. The stuff that needs to run on mobile runs on mobile. We implement it one time. It's the most sort of you know cost efficient way to 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 you know make it a consumer facing app. Um, the the uh, besides that we're using Bitcoin. Uh, we are so here's how it works right now. You have a integrated Bitcoin wallet, like a normal Bitcoin wallet, in the web app. Okay, so when you open up yours and you have like an account, um, you've got the private keys stored in your web browser in a, in, in a web browser database is called IndexedDB, which is built into all modern web browsers now. It's a real database. Um, your your private keys are stored there. Uh, we have a normal Bitcoin wallet working. What we're now working on are the micropayments stuff. So here's how that works. We're basing everything off of the Lightning Network. We write all their papers. Um, they are not, however, done. And so we decided, well, what are we, how are we, you know, we, we basically need micropayments or our product doesn't make any sense. Um, we think micropayments are going to be a huge asset and really make, make the difference between, you know, like, I mean, basically a lot of this content we think is only worth one cent. Um, so like if you had to pay a dollar for it, you're definitely not going to buy it. But if it's one cent, maybe you will. Um, so micropayments make a huge difference. Um, for a, a lot of reasons, we think it's really important that the users control their private keys. So we are sticking very closely to this decentralized peer-to-peer -peer, you know, financial system where the users possess their digital cash and they're sending it directly to another user. Now, we're basing everything on the Lightning Network. Uh, it's, it's, uh, so the way this works is in order to send a payment to another user, you can open up a payment channel with them, but in most cases, you're not going to want to open a payment channel with another user. You need a payment channel open with someone who has a payment channel open with them. And as so long as there's a route to get to that person, you can make payments across these routes. And the way this works is uh, you basically make a payment to an HTLC hash. The other person generates this hash, only they have the secret. You make a payment, you know, to like if Alice is paying Carol via Bob, Alice makes a payment to Bob, Bob makes a payment to Carol. Uh, uh, Carol shares this secret with, with, uh, with Bob to prove that Bob made a payment to Carol. Then Bob shares that secret with Alice to make sure that Bob, to prove that, you know, uh, uh, that, that he made the payment. And then Alice, uh, sort of, now that Alice has the secret, they're able to, uh, they're able to spend the money with, with the secret. So it's just like Lightning Network. It's, it's really the exact, the only differences are things like, um, uh, the actual details of like the message structures and things like that. I'm not sure the scripts are exactly the same. In fact, I think the Lightning Network people stopped using HTLC hashes. Last I heard, they're doing something different. So they've diverged. They're not the same, but it's theoretically based on the Lightning Network. Uh, and then the other trick will be like a matter of, you know, we don't really want to make an incompatible protocol with them. So maybe there's a way we can reconcile later. Uh, but for now, we're, we're just making our own implementation of, of the Lightning Network. And, and so uh, I'm not exactly sure uh, what stage of uh, in, in the roadmap, how, how, how close the Lightning Network is to being compatible and deployed you know, on, the, on the main net. Can you give us an idea of how long it will take until the Lightning Network is, uh, is live and available? Yeah. So let me, I'll give you some more background there. So what, what we're doing is not quite as sophisticated as, as the real Lightning Network. They're making something that is decentralized in every way. We're not making something decentralized in every way. We're making it decentralized in the, in the ways we think are the most important while also balancing launching sooner. So we will probably be able to launch. Well, I don't want to say this for sure because I don't know what their timeline is, but I'll, I'll give you our timeline. Uh, we have the logic of, payment, of, of our network working uh, sort of proof of concept stage. We haven't tested it on Bitcoin testnet yet. We're going to test it on Bitcoin testnet next. That will be fairly soon. I would say... I'll just say a month. I mean, it'll probably be earlier than a month. We're pretty close. Um, what we're then going to do is we have to integrate it into our product because we have the product working. So we have to integrate the micropayments. That's not trivial to integrate into the product, but you know, it's it's easier than making the micropayments work. So then we integrate into the product. Then we start launching our product to a really select audience of people to get feedback on the product itself and making sure the technology works and doesn't lose money. Um, because of course, you know, you could be hacked, or you know, there could be just just bugs that cause people to lose money. Um, so then we launch in phases. So we're going to launch in phases over the next six or so months. 
So we start with a really limited audience and we think just realistically, it's going to take months to build up towards test it with more and more people, uh, test it under harsher and harsher conditions, eventually migrate from Bitcoin testnet to Bitcoin mainnet, and then eventually launch to a real general audience. Uh, and that would be, I'll say early 2017 is when we want to launch to a real general audience. Um, so that's our product th uh, thing. Some things we're doing differently than Lightning are. We have a messaging system that goes through our servers. The messages are encrypted, so we can't read your messages, but the Lightning Network requires that you send messages so to, from user to user. So we don't have a decentralized messaging system. The real Lightning Network guys are, from what I understand, making a real decentralized messaging system of some form. Um, so theirs is a, goes a little bit further than we do. So yeah, so there are some minor differences, but it's basically, you know, ours is, I would say it's a step towards the Lightning Network is how to think about it. And we'll, we'll sort of uh, iterate towards full Lightning Network over time. Okay. Now, just coming back to the technical ar architecture, you mentioned that it was written in JavaScript and, uh, and Node.js. Uh, just from a, from a user's perspective, uh, let's take the example of this uh, manga community you mentioned earlier. You know, let's say you know you onboard uh, people from the manga community and they start using the uh, the the app. Uh, what does it look like? Is it something that you install? Is it in a browser, uh, that you, like a, a web address? Uh, do you have to install like a sort of you know light client in order to access the network? Yeah, there's nothing you have to install. You visit yours.network. That's all you have to do. Other than that, it, it's, it's going to look and feel similar to any other web app. And uh, uh, we will have a mobile app, uh, but we're not building the mobile app now. We're, we're not going to build the mobile app until we're done with the web app and we know that we've built the right product. Then we go to mobile. In, in, in that case, the, the, there's, a, there's a, I assume there's a server somewhere, right? Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not fully decentralized. There's a server. Uh, you're, you're not touching the payment uh, uh, you know, and the transactions that happen because they happen on the browser side, but there is a, there's a server somewhere ma managing the content. Okay. So we, oh, okay. So the content storage is also centralized. Sorry to disappoint people. The content, when you save the content, uh, it is being saved on a server. Uh, and also we're using a blockchain API on a server. So the way that you query the blockchain is not by running a Bitcoin full node in your web browser you are querying uh, a blockchain API that we're running on a server. So there are two ways in which it's centralized. I think, you know, basically we're doing it this way because it's just the fastest way to market. It'd be cool to do it totally decentralized, but we don't think that most of the people that are going to use it are really going to care if it's literally fully decentralized in every way. The one thing that we think is really important that we decentralize are ownership of the digital cash. That's the thing we're being really sure that you possess your digital cash and you're sending money peer to peer. The other things were, were frankly cutting corners on, on it, and we're, it, it's, it's centralized because it's just easier to do it. Uh, so the content storage is stored on a server, uh, and uh, we are using a blockchain API, which is also running on a server. Sounds really cool. Sounds like a really good plan to have parts of it centralized and just have the payments and monetary section decentralized. Uh, so one of the things that, that comes to my mind uh, listening to you is... Uh, in this case, what is happening is people are creating content and they're posting it to a central server and then you will have some kind of financial logic by which they get paid and the users make these payments, right? Now, the success or failure of the system rests on solving the problem of attribution. That I, I created this particular manga comic and only I should be paid for it. Somebody else can't just post this manga comic, for, like take this comic from me, post it, post his public key and get paid instead of instead of me. So there has to be some way by which the attribution problem needs to be solved. And if we look at the total web today, this is a very big unsolved problem. Like if, if, if I do Google image search, I see lots of great images. In none of the cases do I know who really created it. Uh, so what's, do you have a particular plan for solving the attribution problem or what's your approach? Yeah, so the attribution problem is, it's, it's really important to us because you know we're trying to get original content creators paid. We also think you should be able to be paid for discovering content, but let's not confuse discovering with creating. You know, Just because you found a GIF on the internet doesn't mean that you made it. So this is a really important problem to us. There are, there are a lot of techniques that we're going to employ to address the issue. 
Um, I think that, you know, it, it's, it's really hard to thoroughly solve the problem. I'm not sure that anyone has ever thoroughly solved this, like in a complete way, uh, because it's really difficult. Like if you have a piece of information, how do you know who the author is? Like if you can always just copy an image and, you know, like you don't necessarily know. So let me give you the ways that we're going to address this issue. Um, first of all, I think this is the most important one. We need to create a culture of original content creation. We need to make sure that we're not, you know, encouraging people to copy other people. That's wrong. That's immoral. If you're if you're claiming credit for the work that someone else created, you know, that is it's against our terms of service, first of all. Now, having a moral stance there doesn't do very much because I think people that don't care are just going to do it anyway. So we have to have some technical means uh, to, to, to solve this. So the way we do this is several fold, just like any other media website. One is, you know, when it comes to just complying with the law, we actually, we have to follow uh, DMCA, which is where like, if a, if a copyright holder uh, in, uh, you know, sends us a uh, DMCA takedown, we have to comply. Uh, we have to have a process in place to take down the content. So if somebody posts a Hollywood movie, we have to take it down and we have to have that process. So we'll have a, a, a way that they can communicate with us to take down the content. We'll have to take it down. Um, uh, but I think there are better ways. I don't necessarily think that the DMCA really solves the problem either. So other ways to do this are imagine you're linking to some other piece of content on the Internet. There are technical ways we can at least make it harder to copy content. If you have to embed your public key in a piece of content uh, on the Internet. So imagine you're linking to a YouTube video. Your public key has to be in the video. If it's not in the, like in the description, if it's not, then, you know, you know, it could be that you're copying someone else's video. So if you're really the author, you can go into the description and add your public key to it so that we know it's yours, right? At least you, you're linking to something that it's, it's a video that you created on YouTube. Now, of course, you could have still uh, copied the content, uploaded a video separately. And the only way I know how to address that is twofold. One is users need to be able to flag content as violating copyright so that there's a bit of a human powered uh, solution uh, to like you're just flagging it. The other answer is we have to uh, do data analysis. And this is something that the big social media companies do like YouTube. They scan the content. If you're uploading a song that is, you know, whatever, it's some famous artist, um, they scan it and they can tell, hey, this is the exact same song that somebody else created. And it's, it's known and, you know, it's, it's a, you know, whatever it is, it's owned by somebody else. So they, then they delete it. So it's human powered plus auto, something automated. And then we also have to, in complying with the law, we'll have, you know, like we have to comply with DMCA. But then the most important of all these, I really think building a culture of people creating original content. Uh, we need to make sure that you are rewarded for doing original content and you're banned or, you know, you're punished uh, for, for copying and content and making it look like you, you know, created something that you didn't create. Yeah, so the, the, I mean, the copyright problem is 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 uh, is a problem that you're going to have on a digital uh, medium, right? Because it's so easy to copy data. Uh, I mean, some some people are, are looking at w ways that we can solve that. Uh, you know, like a scribe, for instance, uh, is is tackling that problem from a different uh, from a different point of view. But um, so. In, uh, in just before we wrap up here, uh, and it has been a very fascinating conversation, uh, can you tell us about your business model? What is the business model for yours? Yeah, so the business model is really simple. Um, we're going to take a portion of the money. So if you're making a payment, uh, we're, we'll take a percentage. So you know, for for you know, hosting the app, uh, creating creating the app, and everything, we take a percent. We haven't decided what that percent is yet. But it will be lower than, say, YouTube. You guys mentioned, you know, Jenna Marbles, you know, she pays 45% or something like that to YouTube. It will be less than 45%. So it will be low compared to, you know, normal standards. Um, so I don't want to give a number, but it's not going to be extremely low. I, we're not going to promise super, super low. Uh, we're going to take something that makes sense for, for our business. Um, and uh, so it will be sort of, you know, a, a result of computing it sort of, you know, rationally what percent makes sense. So we'll figure that out later. But I think that's the simplest thing. There are other ways we could monetize this. Um, there are ways we maybe could reduce, you know, the fees to, to zero, like the you know, fees of the company, if we could monetize the data or add ads or something like that. I'd really rather not add ads. I think there are so many ways, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, if, if people have money on the app, uh, why not just take a percentage? Like, we don't need to add ads. You know, ads are annoying to people. I'd rather not have any ads. Um, and then, uh, you know, maybe monetizing data. But again, I'd really, I'd really rather explore these sort of financial techniques that are empowered by our technology 
uh, which haven't been possible. I think the reason why most people use ads like Facebook and Google is because uh, it wasn't possible to monetize peer-to-peer -peer payments, but now it is. So we can just you know, earn money directly because people are just paying us stuff. So that's it. It's taking a percentage of payments. Cool. So before we wrap up, where can people find you? How, you know, if there is anything that you'd like people to do, uh, this is the time to tell them to do it. Sure. Yeah. So our website is yours.network. Uh, you know, you can sign up to get a get an early preview uh, if you want uh, at your email address. Uh, you can find us on Twitter. Uh, it's at yours network. Um, you can find me personally on Twitter. It's Ryan X Charles. Uh, and, uh, I'm also on a uh, medium, uh, Ryan X Charles times.com, uh, is where I, uh, write articles and stuff. Um, so yeah, so yours.network and, uh, you know, we ho hopefully, uh, some people would, would be interested in this and want to sign up for our, our mailing list. Well, I, I certainly signed up, so I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, seeing, uh, seeing the, the, the initial, uh, versions as it comes out so you can try it out and, and give it a try. Um, well, thanks a lot, Ryan, for coming on the show. It was a really fascinating discussion about a topic that, uh, I, I always find is kind of, I mean, personally, uh, interesting since we are content creators and, uh, monetization is, um, is something that, uh, well, we do, but we don't, um, get to live off of. So, uh, it's, uh, it's nice to see there's initiatives out there. Uh, trying to, to solve the issue of monetization with cryptocurrency. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks Thanks for having me. It's been awesome. And thanks to our listeners for tuning in. We are part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin network. You can find lots of great shows on letstalkbitcoin.com. Uh, you can find us at epicenterbitcoin.com as well as on uh, YouTube at youtube.com slash epicenterbitcoin. And of course, you can always find us on your favorite podcast app uh, or SoundCloud. Uh, and if you're interested in uh, leaving us a review to get one of these fancy t-shirts, you can do so uh, by leaving us an iTunes review and uh, just sending us an email at show at epicenterbitcoin.com to let us know if you've done so. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.